get to visit that again. <laughs> That's fine. So this paper is part of a larger project on the nature, structure, and implementation of social cognition. And part of what I'm trying to do here is to start to make sense of some sorts of claims about the possibility of group mental states. I got really interested in this project thinking uh, early on about uh, movement that emerged at the foundation of social psychology when uh, people like Gustav Le Bon, uh, Sigmund Freud, um, uh, William McDougall, all these folks who were writing early in the foundations of social psychology claimed that the same sorts of explanatory project that we can take up towards individuals can be taken up towards groups of individuals, and that we should treat groups of individuals in some cases as having minds of their own. So people were really interested in things like crowd psychology and the ways in which ideas flow through crowds that are dissociable from the individuals. That whole project fell apart with the rise of behaviorism, with the rise of cognitive psychology. But in recent years, perhaps unsurprisingly, given the emergence of lots of collective movements um, that we're seeing across the world, people have started to get really interested again in the possibility of making sense of group minds. And one of the things that I want to try and do, and this is the core of my project in the Macrocognition book, is to give an account of what it would take to offer a cognitive psychological theory of collective mentality, one that's grounded in the best going models of cognitive science that are kicking around right now. And this project came about, this particular one on transactive memory, came about because of uh, two things. And I'll start with this one. This is something that has been incredibly prominent in philosophical circles over the last 10 years. And the story to philosophers is now quite familiar. There's a man named Otto. And Otto has started to get a little bit older. He's started to experience the early stages of Alzheimer's. And he started to forget many of the things that he needs to know in order to get around the world that he lives in. One day, Otto goes into his doctor, and his doctor says, well, what you should do is you should just start writing things down in a notebook. And then you just have to remember where you've stored your memories, and you don't need to remember the things yourself. This led Otto to be able to get around his world in a fairly comfortable way. Otto now does pretty well getting around New York City, and everything seems to have worked out wonderfully. That's not the end of the story for Otto, though, because Otto launched an incredibly robust research project in the philosophy of cognitive science, which is this project on the extended mind. The suggestion is that Otto's use of his notebook counts as a form of distributed cognition. And this is a line that was initially pushed by Andy Clark and Dave Chalmers. And over the last 10 years, 10 to 12 years, approximately 200 papers have been published on the possibility that this counts, or something like this counts, as a case of, of extended cognition. Now, if we were just talking about auto, things wouldn't be that exciting. But one way of spelling this out is something that shows up in the introduction to Andy Clark's most recent book. Uh, it's in the introduction by Dave Chalmers. And Dave Chalmers says, look, many of us now find ourselves using our iPhones all of the time to get around our world. We find ourselves offloading many of the sorts of capacities and projects and ideas that we used to have to use our own brains for onto the technology. In a sense, as Andy Clark puts the point, we're all, at this point, natural-born cyborgs. We're all wedded completely and totally to the technology that drives our day-to-day -day behavior. 
Now, I've always been incredibly ambivalent about this suggestion. On the one hand, I'm pretty happy with any sorts of ideas or intuitions that are going to disrupt the sort of assumption, the tacit assumption that many people have that individualistic perspective is the only one that's accessible from the perspective of the cognitive sciences. And on the other hand, much of the literature that's emerged on the possibility of the extended mind cites really cool research in biology, in developmental psychology, in the cognitive sciences more broadly. So I find reading this stuff incredibly interesting. Nonetheless, there are some serious and severe problems that arise in trying to think about the nature and possibility of extended minds. So to start off with, just an intuition to cut against the Dave Chalmers intuition that we're all deeply wedded to our iPhones. As I walk about my city, um, I often find myself um, checking my email, sending an SMS message, or evaluating a student's paper as I'm uh, running late for a meeting. And if I were to walk out in front of a car or walk into a passing bicyclist, it would be me that was responsible for doing that, not me and the union of uh, this sort of distributed system. It's the same sort of mistake that I would make if 10 years ago I was walking down the street reading a book and walked in front of a car, walked into a bicycle. So it seems that considerations of common sense considerations of responsibility cut against the presuppositions that are leading somebody like Chalmers or leading somebody like Andy Clark to treat the human plus iPhone as a single system. Now, of course, appeals to intuitions don't cut much explanatory ice at the end of the day, so that's just an intuition pump against an intuition pump, and that's not going to get us very far. But there are deeper and more fundamental problems. One is the problem of cognitive bloat. That is, the thought that once we start to allow a person and her iPhone to count as a single cognitive system, it becomes incredibly difficult, if not impossible, to rule out the possibility of me plus the enormous amount of coffee that I drink as counting as a single cognitive system. Were it not for the immense amount of coffee that I drink every day, I would be far less frenetic, I would be far less philosophically productive, I would have far less interesting ideas, and I would think far less quickly and far less accurate. But it seems bizarre to treat me plus the thousands of cups of coffee that I drink over the course of my life as a single cognitive system. That looks like a deeper problem, and it points to something that's, I think, the deepest and most fundamental problem with the hypothesis of extended cognition. And that's something that's called the boundary demarcation problem. The thought is, it becomes difficult from the perspective of somebody who wants to think about the extended mind to determine where one cognitive system starts and where it ends, to figure out what the boundaries around a system happen to be, why a system remains stable, why it has the capacities that it does, and this is deeply tied up with the worries about cognitive bloat. Unless we have some stable way of individuating cognitive systems, it becomes impossible for us to actually do cognitive science on these sorts of critters, these sorts of distributed systems. Even if they might be cognitive in some sense, it's not clear how we would go about determining that they were. So, in light of this sort of ambivalence about the hypothesis of extended cognition, I think we need to step back, and to the extent that we want to begin thinking about distributed cognitive systems as something that can be tracked and analyzed from the perspective of cognitive science, I think we'll do better by looking at the dynamic patterns of interchange between persons. And part of what I want to do today is to begin by laying out some very early suggestions about the nature and possibility of transactive memory systems to show why I think that the standard approaches to looking at these things have gone, looking at these things have gone wrong and to show what it would take 
to build a more plausible theory of transactive memory that's grounded in an adequate account of the mechanisms that drive cognitive process. But we can start, as Dan Wegner does in a, a, a set of early papers from the early 80s, with an intuitive case. The case is the old couple who's lived with each other, lived together for many, many years, who over the course of their life together have began to individuate their memories in such a way that he remembers some classes of phenomena, she remembers other classes of phenomena. They know which of them retains which memories. If he wants to know about various things that have to do with auto mechanics, he might ask his partner. If she wants to know various sorts of things that have to do with cooking, she might ask her partner. And their memories become offloaded and distributed in ways that allow them, as a couple, to navigate their day-to-day -day lives. That intuition is an easy case. And we don't actually have to rest content with the mere intuition. Because this series of papers from Dan Wegner and his colleagues attempted to ground that in a set of experimental studies. So what they did is they brought into the lab uh, a bunch of couples. And they either let the couples work together, as they always have, or they separated them and rearranged them so that people who had never met one another were given the same sort of task. The task was a memory task where they were presented with a series of words from a series of different categories. So they were asked to remember things about uh, fruits, about vegetables, about automobiles, about uh, uh, various other sorts of categories. Now the twist is half of each of these groups, both the couples who had been together and the couples who had just met, half of each of those groups were given lists of things to focus on. And half were told, go ahead and focus on whatever you want to. The results of this experiment were that the group who did the best across all of those groups was the group who were long-term couples who were not given any information about what they should focus on. Next best were the couple who had just met and were told what sorts of things each person should remember. The group that did the worst overall was the group who had been a long-term couple and were presented with classes of information that they should focus on. The hypothesis that's suggested by Dan Wegner and his colleagues is that what happens here is that people form as part of transactive memory systems a set of allocation, uh, resource allocation procedures that divide up how information is going to be remembered. And when you introduce a novel classification scheme on top of that, what you do is you introduce noise into the system that makes the default strategies for remembering corrupt. And that's why the people who are long-term couples, they claim, who are told to focus on things that they wouldn't ordinarily focus on, do terribly in this memory task. Wigner contends that what we see here is a sort of distributed information processing. Evidence for the fact that this sort of intuitive case of the old couple actually shows us a way in which memory, narrative memory especially, can be grounded in a distributed information processing system. And as one further piece of data, he points to the fact that bad things happen to these memory systems when one partner is lost. What you find is something that looks like a 404 error. You find the memory that there is something to be remembered. You find a recognition, a feeling of knowing 
about a particular class of phenomena that's associated with your long-term partner. But instead of being able to retrieve that knowledge, instead of being able to retrieve that uh, memory, what you come up with is a blank. You come up with the feeling of knowing attached to nothing. So building from these sorts of thoughts, Wegener suggests that what we have, what we find in the case of transactive memory systems, is a set of networks and interfaces. And that memory for many sorts of, of groups, for many sorts of people, ends up being something that's distributed, that's allocated, and that allows for the uh, referring of my meta-memories, my memories that I have memories, referring those to addresses that are located at other people. The thought then is that memory functions as a sort of archiving, as a uh, strategy of taking the things that I remember retaining a tag that tells me where things are located, and then the memory itself, which can either be located in the same system or located in another system. In much the same way, the set of network computers can retain a representation of a file on the machine that refers to processing that will be done on another machine. The suggestion here is that what we see in human memory is a system that encodes memories topically, that stores them in associative networks, and that uses a system of metamemories to pick out the location in those associative networks where a memory is going to be stored. Now, it's worth keeping that fact in mind and the structure of this sort of proposal in mind. Because what it uh, turns on is a claim about the archival nature of memory. A claim that memories are semantically robust, stored representations that are there to be retrieved, that are there to be indexed, there to be reported upon, upon their retrieval. In this case, what we see is that all of the processing that goes on goes on in the brains and minds of individuals. But what makes this a single system is the interfacing of the representations, in part through language, in part through gesture, in part through the, whatever strategies happen to be employed by a couple or by a larger group as they allocate resources, as they allocate information processing, and as they allocate the distribution of those memory resources. Now, in a sense, this looks like a fairly cool and fairly straightforward strategy for driving at an account of extended cognition that doesn't run afoul of these worries about cognitive bloat, <coughs> that doesn't run afoul of these worries about boundary demarcation. We know how to individuate the systems. We know what the mechanisms are. We know what the interfaces are. Or at least we can work that out in a reasonably plausible way. This looked good to me until a paper came out by Betsy Sparrow and her colleagues in science about a year ago. This is another paper with Dan Wegner. And what Sparrow and her colleagues argue is that what we're beginning to do, given our use of Google, given our use of the internet, given our use of computers, is that we're starting to offload memories onto the internet, offload memories onto our computers, and offload processing in exactly the same way that we do between individuals onto these machines. And that slips us right back into the same sorts of problems that arise in the case of the extended mind. 
Now, well, actually, let me say a little bit more about that before I go. So what they found it, when they investigated people's integration, they claimed, with computers, is that when you give people hard questions, hard trivia questions that they're not going to know the answers to, what you find is that primes them to think about computers. So when you do subsequent uh, fill in the, the blank sorts of, of texts, what you find is that people fill those in in a way that's consistent with thinking about computers, even though computers have never been mentioned. So the thought is that people are beginning to think that when, when I'm presented with something that's difficult, that I don't know the answer to, what do I do? I think about the computer. I think about Google. I think about my uh, desktop, whatever it happens to be. And what they also found is that when people are given a task where they're told that they're going to have access to a database later, what they do is they begin to encode memories of where things are going to be stored. They encode memories of where on the desktop folders are going to be, where in the file structure they're going to be able to find information. And they don't remember the information itself. So the thought is that what we're getting here is something that looks a lot like the sort of structure we see using memories and metamemories. We see the retention of information about what we're not going to have access to. And we remember where we're going to have access. We remember where to look. So the slogan that they suggest is that our use of Google has created a transactive memory system such that we remember what we won't have access to, and otherwise we remember where to look. Now, this seems a little bit too quick for my tastes. It may well be true that we use Google and we use our iPhones and other <coughs> smartphones in ways that are epistemically useful, in ways that constitute nice, usable tools, but it's not clear that they're anything more than tools. What we find is that we learn to use Google when we're trying to remember a movie that we haven't thought about before. We use it as a cue. We use our smartphone to navigate unfamiliar cities, but we use it as a tool that we can exploit in the service of projects that we already happen to have. And we use our savviness with the internet to find hip, new, cool, underground restaurants that we can go to. But all of these processes would go on just fine if you swapped out the relevant class of tools with another functionally equivalent tool. It might go on slower. It might take me longer to figure out where the hip, new restaurants are if I have to learn that by word of mouth, if I have to learn that by talking to friends, if I have to learn it by walking around a city. It might take me a little longer to figure out where I am if I've got to look at street signs and calibrate that against the map. But all of these processes go on regardless of whether you remove these sorts of components from the system. So in a sense, the internet and our use of the internet might modify our info informational landscape. It might lead us to exploit context-specific information to simplify problem solving. But it's not in any way obvious that that should count as part of a cognitive system. I think that once we allow these sorts of things to start counting as parts of cognitive systems, we face real deep worries about why it is that you shouldn't count me and some obscure server that happens to be kicking around in Finland that happens to be running the processing for Google as part of a cognitive system of which I'm only a part. And that's only a very short step away from the sorts of worries that arise in thinking about me and my use of coffee as part of a single cognitive system. Now, there are moves that philosophers mainly have tried to make in order to ground these sorts of claims that you get from people like Sparrow, from people like Wagner. 
And the first is a claim about parity. It says, look, when you think about the way in which memory works, you can either think about it in terms of the biological structures that are grounded in the brain, or you can think about the functions that are being carried out. And here what you see is that the phenomenon of remembering where a hip new restaurant is goes on as a single phenomenon, regardless of whether it's housed in my head or housed in this distributed system. And to the extent that we want to think about the way in which real world, on the fly, online coping goes on, what we're going to find is that we need to start focusing on these distributed systems rather than focusing on just the structure of brains. Well, the problem here is that there's absolutely no reason, or at least no obvious reason, to think that the level of analysis where we're talking about task solving, problem solving, memory in this sort of way, is the right sort of level of analysis for the cognitive sciences. It might be. But merely to stipulate that some broad scale pattern is the thing that we ought to focus on, that looks arbitrary. And it doesn't give us a way of figuring out what systems to look at, when to look at them, and how to analyze them. This seems like a bad factor. And what we need then is something that's going to go a bit deeper into the structure <coughs> of human cognition to explain why certain sorts of processes ought to be included as parts of cognitive systems. In a series of incredibly interesting papers and now two books, Lynn Tribble has argued that what we can see when we look at the patterns of things like learning how to be an Elizabethan actor is that the only way in which it becomes possible for someone to carry out their tasks, for someone to carry out the task of being an Elizabethan actor, is by understanding the structure of a distributed cognitive system. Now, here's the reason for that. An Elizabethan actor would typically play five distinct parts over the course of a week. One of those would typically be new something that he had never done before. The rest of them he may have done before, but it would, be, would have been a very long time since, because over the course of a series of weeks, you would have almost no repetition in the plays that were ran, in the parts that were played, and in the practices that were carried out. And what we need is a story about how it is that an Elizabethan actor can come to be successful in playing all these roles. Doing a lot of hard anthropological investigation, Lynn Tribble has found that much of the work that was necessary for playing an Elizabethan, the role of an Elizabethan actor, much of that work was made possible because of the structure of the theater, because of the way in which space was organized, and the way in which cues could be distributed across the structure of the space. We all learn very early on that one strategy for improving your memory, one strategy for improving the structure of a presentation or a conversation, is to begin by placing things in particular orders along some abstract imagined space. Tribble's claim is that that sort of phenomena is something that can go on indoors or outdoors. It becomes possible for the Elizabethan actor to map her roles or his roles around the various structures in the architecture of the theater. Beyond that, there were cue sheets that were hung at each of the entrance, entrances. They were thin. They said very little. They didn't specify the things you would say or the ways you'd move. They specified only the patterns of entrance and the patterns of exit and the patterns of interchange between people. They were minimal cues that could be used by a person to elaborate the memory on the fly 
in order to carry out all of this role play. Now, this looks, claims Tribble, like a case of the distribution of cognition. Part of it takes place in the skull, part of it takes place in the structure of our environment. But before we move too quickly, I think it's always wise to remember a little example by Herbert Simon of an ant walking along the sand whose movement looks incredibly um, direct, looks incredibly purposeful, looks incredibly intricate. You might think, looking at the ant scuttling across the sand, that it's moving in the way that it is because of some internal plan or process. But we all know that that's not the case. What the ant does is follows the gradients in the texture of the sand. It needs to be very dumb in order to do what it does. But because of the structure of its immediate environment, because of the cues that it's constantly getting, and the dense feedback relations between the ant and its environment, it carries out really sophisticated and complex tasks. That scales up to the point where <coughs> even things like the construction of massive termite mounds that are highly intricate, that are highly sophisticated, and that arise merely on the basis of detecting pheromone traces and having a tendency to drop your mud balls next to the sweet smelling pheromones. Because of the flow of air through an emerging termite mound, you get drift of pheromones that lead termites to place things in different places. You get massive structure with very little intelligence. And I think that part of what we see when we look at a case like the Globe Theater is that much of human cognition could go on in ways that turn on the use of external resources, the use of external cues to elaborate more robust memories. A plausible account of social cognition, I think, this is following on a claim by John Hoagland, needs and presupposes something internal that explains how and why people can learn to talk, to form elaborate societies, to draw up biographies, whereas dogs and trees cannot. In the same way, an adequate account of memory requires, presupposes, something internal, some set of mechanisms that explain how we can carry out sophisticated acting roles, how we can give the sorts of talks that we do without reference to very much at all written or presented. But trying to figure out what the delicate interchange between those internal structures and those external structures is, that becomes a difficult task that we need to think very carefully about in attempting to ground a theory of memory. So what I want to do in the remainder of this paper is to begin to lay out a mechanistic approach to memory specifically that shows how various sorts of active and dynamic internal mechanisms allow us to exploit socially significant information. I think that in the vast majority of cases, what we'll find is that that exploitation doesn't yield distributed cognition in any sense. It yields the use of tools of various sorts. But I think from this same perspective, what we can see is that distributed cognition, distributed memory, makes sense where agents are so intertwined with entities outside of themselves that the responsible system, to go back to my first intuition, includes one or more cognitive agents and their environment. Where the system that's responsible for remembering, where the system that's responsible for the actions that arise from memories requires <coughs> multiple agents that have to be integrated in a particular way in order to carry out their tasks. In building out this theory, 
I'm going to begin from the initial intuitions that we saw from Dan Wagner about transactive memory systems. But I'm going to set it against two of his more neurally interested and neurally sophisticated colleagues. Stephen Coslin, who a couple of years back wrote a paper on, transact, uh, on transactive memory systems and social prosthetics, trying to argue that there are many ways in which we exploit external resources. And Dan Schachter, who's been doing beautiful and fascinating work on the role of various sorts of neural mechanisms in the construction and reproduction of memories. My thought here is that by looking at this unholy trinity of Harvard psychologists and thinking about the ways in which the sort of picture that's sketched by Wagner that can be implemented in something like social prosthetic, uh, prosthetic systems, the sort that Coslin talks about, and that is grounded in an account of the neuroscience of memory and the cognitive science of memory, can yield some, but not many, cases of transactive memory systems that can only be explained and made intelligible from the perspective of the distributed cognitive system. So let's begin by thinking about what sort of thing memory is, what sort of task it faces, and why it has to do the things that it does. The first thing to remember is that we live in an, incre in an incredibly information-rich world. And there are processing demands on what brains like ours can do, as well as working memory demands on what we can encode. Given that that's the case, we don't encode everything that we see, we don't encode everything that we hear. Instead, by and large, we tend to encode just like representations of our environment. We tend to encode the things that are salient allowing ourselves to fill in the gaps where necessary with things that we don't need to encode. One pithy way of putting this is suggested in a 98 paper on the embodied and uh, uh, situated mind by John Hogler, who says, look, if you want to know what shelf the beer is on in the refrigerator, go look. You don't have to remember that. You've got access to the refrigerator. You know where to go. You know what to do. Encoding all of that information about what things are on what shelves in the refrigerator, refrigerator is useless to you. You don't need to do it. So don't encode it. That doesn't mean that the process of remembering requires the use of, of the refrigerator and the beer. What it means is that there is a big distinction between the sorts of tasks that we carry out using cognitive processes that are more like memory and the sorts of things that we carry out using processes that are way more like perception. Whereas the beer in the fridge looks way more like a perceptual task, at least in most cases. Not everything needs to be represented. Now, once we start to think about things in that way, once we start to think about the way in which we attend only to salient sorts of information, only to information that's going to be relevant to our ongoing projects, we can start to get a bit more insight into some of the really interesting phenomena that show up in memory research. So starting with a very old study by Bartman in 1932, what we see is that people tend to remember only some of the things that they're presented, and their memory tends to fill in the rest of the details when they're asked to do some sort of memory task. So Bartlett's task was to present people with stories that included surreal events. 
that included as central components stories about ghosts, stories about spirits, things that were unfamiliar to the vast majority of the participants in the study. And then brought these participants back into the lab a week later. What he found is that the stories normalized. They became far less surreal. They became far more familiar. The ghosts that had played a, a prominent role, and indeed a central role in the stories, often disappeared. There was no discussion of that. Instead, they were replaced by people, by agents that were more familiar. And this generalized. And what Bartlett suggests is that we should see memory not as a matter of recall, not as a matter of retrieval, but as a constructive process. Now, we can get a little bit more traction on that suggestion that memory is a constructive process by looking to one of the most prominent models of memory research over the last 20 years. And this is the uh, DRM project of presenting people. This is uh, DC, <coughs> Roger, and McDermott project of presenting people with series of words that are related to each other in some fundamental respect. So you have your subjects listen to the uh, set of words, nurse, sick, medicine, lawyer, health, hospital, dentist, physician, ill, patient, office, stethoscope, clinic, surgeon, and cure. After a brief uh, dis distraction task, often about two minutes, you then present them with a series of questions about whether particular words were on the list. You ask them, was hospital on the list? Was Apple on the list? Was doctor on the list? And what you find is that for words that were on the list, like hospital, you see a standard sort of uh, curve, serial progression, of how likely it is that somebody will remember that the item was on the list. If it's very early in the list, they're incredibly likely to remember it. If it's very late in the list, they're incredibly likely to remember it. But around the middle of the list, for things in this area, they're at about 50%. When you see what people say about Apple, about 8% of the time, 10% of the time, somebody will say, yeah, I think it was on there. But it's incredibly inconsistent, and it's not stable across participants. But when you get a word like doctor, which shares an enormous amount in common with the things that are all actually on the list, you find that the word behaves essentially like an item in the middle of the list. It shows up at about 50% of the time people remember it. It's enormously consistent, it's enormously robust, and it holds up <coughs> over an incredibly wide range of different phenomena. Not just lists of words, but presentations of shapes, presentations of colors, presentations of objects, presentations of sounds. All of this stuff shows up robustly with the same sort of pattern. And it turns out that in some cases, you can get the, uh, the, the object that wasn't on the list but is semantically related to show up at about 70% on memory. Where it shows up, <coughs> People tend to report that as a strong memory. They tend to say that they're just as sure that that item was on the list as that hospital was on the list. And in many cases, you can even get them to describe the accent of the person who spoke the word that wasn't on the list, the tone of their voice, the point in the list where it showed up. And from the first person perspective that just shows up, as a memory. Now, the fact that this pattern of responses is enormously robust 
and enormously consistent, starts to suggest that the mechanism that's operative in the production of memories is, at least in part, a constructive system. A system that operates by not retrieving things that are archived, but by generating plausible hypotheses and plausible assumptions about whether or not the thing was on the list. Now, it turns out that over an enormous range of different phenomena, over an enormous different range of different memory tasks, over imagining the past, imagining the future, and engaging in counterfactual reasoning. Three seemingly distinct sorts of tasks. You see a core network of neural architecture that's operative in allowing us to work out counterfactuals, to remember, and to engage in prospective future-oriented thinking. Strikingly, it turns out that when you start to get patients with Alzheimer's who start to have difficulty remembering events in the past, their capacity for counterfactual thinking and their capacity for forward thinking about the future ends up degrading as well. And the suggestion coming out of Dan Schachter's lab is that the system that's operative in memory is by and large a constructive system. <laughs> a system that's grounded in our domain general capacity for evaluating counterfactual situations, for evaluating them for plausibility, for reasonability, and for figuring out what we can infer on their basis. This is a capacity that comes online very young, as uh, uh, Dina Slotnick and Paul Bloom have shown. Even four-year-old, five-year-old kids have robust theories about the sorts of things that can co-occur, the sorts of things that can arise together in an imaginary situation. And the suggestion is that this capacity to imagine, to engage in counterfactual uh, simulation, plays a critical role in remembering. Now, one other sort of task will help to give us the last piece of the picture that I want for the architecture of a memory system that will help us to make sense of the possibility of transactive memory. And this is the possibility or the, the experience of retrieval-induced forgetting. So what you do is you present people with a series of uh, uh, stimuli that pair things like birds with animals, cows with animals, cars with vehicles, trains with vehicles. And then you present them with a series of tasks that focus on only part of the list, that direct their attention to only the birds. And over a long series of tasks, you get them to fill in the gaps, to focus on remembering the things that show up on that list. What you find is that when you present people with this sort of stimuli, that they begin to remember the things that they focused on, and they remember, to go back, they remember the vehicle car, the vehicle train very well. They remember the animal bird very well but they don't remember the class of phenomena that are very closely related to animal and bird. Those memories degrade rapidly because they focused on something that's close by, that's related, and the memories that are then consolidated leave the associations only in terms of the rehearsed items, but not the closely related non-rehearsed items. And the suggestion here is that, in a sense, Wagner was partially right. Memory is grounded in an associationist system of a sort. It's grounded in a system that links various sorts of representations together. 
such that when you begin to focus on one set of these associations, you strengthen that part of the memory network. Those things that are encoded as traces in memory, such that you can't then focus on the things that are closely related. Those connections end up being less heavily weighted. Those connections end up being dampened. And memory ends up focusing only on the things that you were presented with, but uh, focused on, or that were not related to the category of stimuli that you focused on. OK. Now, that generalizes outside of the lab, and in really important and politically significant ways. So in a series of papers that have come out very recently, it's been suggested that this retrieval-induced forgetting can also be socially shared. And one case where it ends up being socially shared is in the suggestion that there are we weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Well, how do you get people to forget about that? How do you get people to forget about the socially pernicious claims that have been made? You don't deny them. Instead, you don't talk about them. You avoid talking about them and talk about things that are very closely related about how successful uh, we are at winning the war on terrorism, about the terrible things that are going on in Iran. That sort of focus, the thought runs, seems to dampen our ability to retrieve and remember the things that should have been deeply salient to us, the things that should have been deeply present to our thinking. OK. so. What can we get out of this? Well, to go back to this initial suggestion, I think that the key insight is that out of a few stored bone chips, we're capable of remembering a whole di dinosaur. We encode sparsely. We encode cues that allow us to remember using a counterfactual process of simulating of engaging in narrative construction, of laying out a range of possibilities for how those memory traces can be elaborated into consistent representations of the world that we experienced, of the world that we'll imagine in the future. The thought is that because we live in such an information-rich world, and because of the processing demands, because of the way we encode just based representations, what we find is that we need to use a counterfactual modeling process to fill out our memories. In many cases, we use internal structures as anchors. But as the case of the Globe Theater suggests, we can also exploit external anchors in construct <coughs> these networks. Are those part of the memory? Well, likely not. In the case of the external structures, those are functioning as cues. Cues that can be exploited by a system that's dedicated to constructing a narrative representation of a situation, to constructing a counterfactually elaborated thought. But many times, and in many cases, our event-based memories, our narrative capacities, are embedded in deep and rich social networks, where the cues that are relevant for the construction of a particular memory are embedded in the psychologies of different people. People who have focused on different things, people who care about different things, people who we work together with in order to carry out collectively directed projects. The process, and this is the key, I think, the process of narrative reconstruction a process that internally has to go on often through a linguistic medium, especially in the case of episodic remembrance. That process can be externalized. It can be realized in language. And what we seem to find, and this was the insight that Wagner saw in his early studies, is that we can use the cues that are stored between individuals as a foundation for narrative reconstruction 
as a foundation for the production and reconstruction of episodic memories. Now, here too, we need to recognize that there are different ways in which individuals can be used and in which individuals can collaborate. In many cases, as exemplified by the Oak Ridge National Laboratory, which was where uranium-235 was synthesized during the uh, Second World War, what we saw is that there was a single person who had all of the knowledge that was necessary, and then he would allocate different tasks to a variety of women who had, most of them never graduated from high school. Few of them had never graduated from college. Allocate information to them in a way that would allow them to carry out the tasks that he needed to be carried out. Oppenheimer essentially used individuals as tools. He used them as structures that could be exploited in the service of his production of knowledge. And I think the thing that we need to think about in addressing the possibility of transactive memory systems is the possibility that in many cases what we see is exploitative relationships. It's a strategy of using another person as an external hard drive. Using a person in the same way that you would use the internet, in the same way that you might use your desktop. This brings us to what I think is a slogan that needs to form the foundation for any plausible theory of transactive memory. And the suggestion is that collaboration is the mark of the cognitive, but exploitation is the mark of the tool. And the thought is that what we find in the vast majority of cases, where memory looks initially to be socially shared, looks initially to be distributed, what we find is that people are being used as tools. But in some cases, perhaps only a very narrow range of cases, cases like our old couple, what you find is, in some of these cases, people learn to work with one another in the service of projects that are directed by their shared interests, by their shared commitments, and by their shared goals. Where this goes well, what we see is a strategy of queuing and re-queuing, of calibrating our narrative representation, of adjusting as new information is presented, as new information arises, in order to generate a narrative that's shared between these people, that's authorized by these people, that's treated as something that we remember. And where that happens, through this process of queuing and re-queuing, adjusting, recalibrating, <coughs> all in the service of creating a plausible narrative of what we did together, what we find is a sort of robust integration that allows the couple, as such, to respond to various sorts of environmental contingencies that are salient to the couple. Contingencies that might not be salient to one member um, that might uh, only be salient or relevant because of the structure of the group itself or of the pair itself. Through language, through gesture, through various forms of communication, you get a consolidation of a narrative that is transactive, that is grounded in the structure of the group, not in the structure of an individual's mind, but that exploits the resources that are shared and common among this group. So what do we then say about the use of the iPhone? Well, it seems like right now, what we see is a way in which the encoding on my side ends up being much more sparse, ends up relying on various sorts of external tools that allow me to carry out tasks that I wouldn't otherwise carry out. Perhaps as technology gets more sophisticated, we might get to a place 
where you get the sort of continuous reciprocal feedback and collaboration and adjustment and cooperative narrative construction that allows something like this to count as a single cognitive system. But we sure don't have it now. And I think that gives us a way of intervening on the extended mind debates, of explaining why that ambivalence is warranted, why we should recognize that in the vast majority of cases, the sorts of things that people who appeal to the extended mind take as evidence is evidence for exploitation, is evidence for the use of tools, is evidence for the use of various sorts of external structures, but not evidence for the collaborative and constructive operation of a single system. We'll end there.